Uh, Marina Liang is an experienced threat researcher who has dug into intrusions in Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and cloud environments. Uh, Marina's submission caught our eye, though, because it had a combination of things we don't get to see all that often, uh, state actors in the Mac OS space. So please welcome the Mac uh, to the AttackCon stage, Marina. All right, hi guys, uh, thanks for coming. I know it's after lunch, I know you probably need some caffeine, so um, I appreciate you being here. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So first off, this is my first time at AttackCon, and also my first time presenting, and also my first time since COVID speaking to a live audience, so a lot of firsts. Um, so in terms of agenda, so who am I? Obviously, uh, overview of the Lazarus Group. Um, they have many names, right? All the different EDR vendors like to name them a couple different things. So we'll use Lazarus Group uh, since that's the MITRE sanctioned uh, terminology. Well, they're sent into macOS and, of course, some newish macOS techniques. Um, last but not least, I know a lot of you guys are probably defenders, blue teams, and you want to know how do I detect how to prevent this. So I have a ton of recommendations. And then if we get to it, if we have time, some Q&A. If not, I'll be on the couch and you're welcome to... Um, you know, DM me on Slack or hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, so who am I? Um, so I am a security researcher, um, not so slow to hit, open to connecting. Um, I've been in the InfoSec community for seven years, um, primarily focused on Windows, recently been diving head in, head first into Mac. Um, I've worked across EDR vendors like Carm Black and CrowdStrike, and my background is like threat research, MDR, threat hunting, SecOps, EDR, purple teaming, IR, so anything with an R in it, <laughs> um, and detection engineering. So I am newly very active with the MITRE community. In the last year, I submitted a couple of techniques, um, notably for Windows, the Phantom DLL hijacking, and for Mac, um, TCC, da TCC database jumping. Um, so hopefully that makes the next version coming out next week. I haven't seen it, but fingers crossed. Jamie's smiling, so maybe it did, hopefully. <laughs> um, and I am human. I have great hobbies. I like to dance. Um, I do ballet. I love yoga. I I love eating, I love cooking, probably too much. And here's my LinkedIn if, you're, if you'd like to connect. OK, so who is the Lazarus Group? Um, they have a ton of names, Labyrinth Chalima, Hidden Cobra, Ander, and Ariel. Um, there's a bunch of different names for this adversary. Um, and why should you guys care? So first off, they're across cross-platform. So your Windows, Mac, Linux, even cloud. Um, so if you're sitting here being like, oh, I don't have Macs in my environment, right? Uh, you should still care because they are very, um, they're very uh, competent across all operating systems, and they are nation state sponsored um, by North Korea. So they have the, the manpower, they have the resources, they also have the desperation since we know North Korea's economy is not doing so great. Um, they are notorious, so you might have heard of them from the Sony breach, WannaCry, a 3CX, and Jump Cloud recently this year for the supply chain compromises. Um, as I mentioned, uh, their motivations. Uh, historically, was cyber espionage, but as of late, with the economy um, of North Korea, currency generation, and the best way of doing that, cryptocurrency, right? It's unregulated, you can't, uh, it's hard to detect, and it's very lucrative, and they've been doing amazing at it with uh, some sources estimating like $2 billion worth of crypto, um, just to these guys. So with that targeted verticals, there's a ton um, in the last few years, fintech, obviously your crypto, um, companies, and then also aerospace and defense, but across the board. And because of their targeting, their geographies also various wherever these companies reside. But in the past, it was South Korea, right? North Korea, South Korea, that makes sense. OK, so let's dive into the Mac OS side. Um, they are great at social engineering. So here's a rough timeline of their recent social engineering um, campaigns. So in 2019, right, we, we saw COVID hit. Uh, in December and with 2020, COVID is all over the news, right? A global pandemic. And they targeted AstraZeneca, and there's multiple reasons they could have done that. For one, we're in a pandemic, right? They want the information to create the vaccines, give that back to their regime. Also, maybe for extortion for profit, right? Everyone's desperate to be out of the pandemic. Um, in 2019, 2020, we saw Operation Dream Job. They, tar they targeted the aerospace uh, and defense industries, primarily located in Eastern Europe. From there, 2021, 2020, sorry, 2020, 2021, uh, target cybersecurity researchers. And what they love to do is pose as 
an alias on LinkedIn. So they're a fake recruiter, a fake researcher, work for a fake company. They go ahead and actually make like the websites. It looks very legit. I've checked them out. Like they, they look very uh, convincing. And especially now chat GPT is a thing. You can just, you know, tell it, make me like a website description, right? Plug and play. So they go the whole gamut. They also have people like the, their resources hyping them up. So it seems like they're legit people. They have connections, they have followers, they have blogs about um, a bunch of these things. So from the, uh, the unassuming eye, it looks like they're a legit company or a legit person. Um, with that, in the recent years, they've been targeting crypto, right? As I mentioned, they need money. And the easiest way um, is to, to target those crypto uh, companies. So what they did is they created PDFs as for job vacancies at crypto companies, both fake and real. Um, with that, we saw 2023 had a bunch of layoffs, right? So more people are desperate to get jobs. So this is only going to continue. It's been lucrative. Um, they pose as recruiters for large companies like the, the fan companies um, that people are desperate to get into. So they send them interview questions and that's where they have the malware um, and lures embedded. So with that, at the bottom, you can see they use everything. They use your LinkedIn, your WhatsApp, your Telegram, right? Discord, Keybase, email, um, every social media platform you can think of. OK, so what about their tools? Um, that saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, they have a lot of tool and theme reuse. So notably is apple juice. I put parts one and two, but I realized uh, when I was researching this, there's like like eight versions of apple juice. And this is a fake installer and macOS malware for cryptocurrency exchange. So what they do is they take existing cryptocurrency applications, they copy it, and then they embed their lures into it. For persistence across all apple juice uh, variants, they have a post install script, literally called post install, um, that installs the malware as a launch daemon. So anyone familiar with Mac, that's a very um, typical uh, persistence mechanism. And then they hide this plist, right? plist for the Windows folks thinks registries, but it's a, it's a file that has key value pairs. Um, and they store this in the application's resource directory. And then they sign, but not with an Apple developer ID. So I'll dive into that a little bit more because it's a little bit more nuanced. But I have a screenshot of one of their fake, uh, their fake websites. So it looks legit, right? It's a smart cryptocurrency, Union Crypto Trader, has cute little logos. It looks like a legit website. OK, so they're a nation state, meaning they have the resources, the manpower, and the determination. So they've actually created their own in-house tool. It's called Mata. You also might know it as MataNet, Mata Framework, or Dackles. Again, all of vendors love to name things different things to confuse us. <laughs> um, but this is a custom tool. And this is cross-platform, Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, originally designed for other operating systems, they started uh, targeting Mac. Um, a little bit after 2018. And we've seen that, again, with um, their social engineering, they love to use masquerading. So they pretend to be a cryptocurrency, they pretend, sorry, a crypto app, they pretend to be your common apps, like your Google Chromes, your Zooms, right? Just things that you normally have installed on your desktop. Um, they impersonate the font, I thought that was interesting. Um, and recently more developer packages, right? A lot of MacBooks, uh, there's a lot of developers that will use them. So like your Fiddler, your Ruby Gems, PyPy packages, like they've uploaded fake PyPy packages and people not looking, just download it. Um, don't check that, it's like, oh, only two days old. Um, and have like no downloads. Okay, so Mata is a bit of a mystery. There is um, public information about them, but there's not a ton of Mac OS samples out there. So if you are in the Mac realm, um, please hit me up so I can do more research on this. But here's a rough timeline um, of this tool. So in 2018, we saw the first sample. This was reported by 360 NetLab and it was Windows and Linux. In 2020, we saw the first Mac OS variant uh, uploaded to VirusTotal. And this was, uh, again, masquerading, right? Pretending to be a 2FA app based off of um, a GitHub tool, Amina OTP, but it's called a Tinka OTP, so impersonated files. Um, in 2020, 2022, so I used to work at Carm Black, my former coworker, uh, Takahiro, he scanned the internet for two years, so kudos to him. And he detected 121 Mata C2 servers during that time. So they were definitely active, right? Um, but he also noted that the numbers were declining. But we saw a continued use of Mata in 2023 with uh, more developer package masquerading. So here they impersonated Ruby gems. And if you're a blue team, you're like, how do I detect this? Um, it is admittedly a little bit whack-a-mole, right? 
because what you'd have to look for is uh, packages executing from unsanctioned directory. So in this case, um, the RB files should not exist in the extensions directory. So that's how we're able to identify these are not the legit files, even though they're named properly, even though the rest of the path is in fact correct. OK, so at a previous job, I was a Mac OS IR lead, and also I was an admin. So when I heard about the Gem Cloud breach, I cringed. Um, they use Mac OS RMM tools. So anyone familiar with Linux, or, or sorry, Windows, there's a ton of RMM tools you can use on the Windows side. On the Mac side, there's only a handful. And the fact that they were able to compromise Jump Cloud in a supply chain attack to target, what else? Crypto companies, right? They targeted the crypto industry. It was only a small handful. But um, the fact that they had access to existing infrastructure, um, they would use Jump Cloud to deploy malicious Ruby scripts and Mako executables onto the victim hosts. So why Jump Cloud? Um, for the obvious reasons, RM tool. They have the right permissions, right? Admin tools uh, give you a lot of permissions to run what you want. You can schedule it, right? You'll, uh, you can enumerate sensitive files. And also as a previous admin, um, it's really noisy, right? And all admin tools look like malware. <laughs> if you ever had a baseline for it, it's a royal pain. It's very noisy. So just from an admin perspective, it is a lot of alert fatigue uh, to go through this. But you know, you have to you have to be able to identify what is normal in your in your environment and what type of scripts are typically running. So, but uh, props to the adversary. It is great for them to blend into the noise. Um, and here is a screenshot I took from Meandian's blog post. They had a great um, a kill chain of how this happened using spear phishing of a Jump Cloud employee. Um, they're able to access Jump Cloud environment and, as I mentioned, ro run the Ruby scripts and drop their malicious executables. OK, recent TTPs. Um, so before I dive into what I submitted to MITRE as new techniques, um, I know a lot of you guys aren't familiar with what this database even is, so a quick primer on the TCC database. So those of you guys have Macs, whenever you download something and then if there's a pop-up saying, do you want to allow so-and-so to access so-and-so, right? You say allow or do not allow. So your responses to that prompt get stored into this database. So Apple implemented this as a means to prevent apps from accessing sensitive data without your user permission, right? So it was a good intentions for implementing this. And permissions include like full disk access, microphone, camera, contacts, um, specific folders like your desktop, downloads, right? But it's not all encompassing, but it covers a good amount. So in theory, it sounds like a good thing to implement. Um, there's two locations, one system-wide and one user. So there are a lot of pitfalls, unfortunately, with this implementation. Um, if you want to dive into more of this, I have cited Phil Stokes. Uh, he wrote a very in-depth article about this, um, the Sentinel-1. So make sure to check that out. I also have the link here. But I'll give you the TLDR. Um, so let's just say you're an admin and you granted yourself uh, your full disk access via terminal you're also granting other users access to your files. So that seems like a glaring uh, hole, right? But it's also great for attackers. Um, another, uh, another glaring pitfall is if an app has the right access via the TCC database, if you dropped your malware into that app folder, then you have those accesses too. So it's very straightforward privilege escalation. Um, and it you know, makes any Mac OS admin shudder. Uh, there's a bunch more, but I don't. I only have half an hour, so I won't go to all of them. But Finder's an another gaping hole as well. Finder has access to everything, and it's not even um, recorded. Uh, it's not even visible to the user. Okay, so back to Lazarus Group. Now that we know what this database does, what do we see the Lazarus Group doing? They dump this database. Um, Another glaring hole, if you're able to write to this database, then you can give yourself the permissions and the user will never be notified. They'll never know. So that's also great. Um, system integrity protection is supposed to mitigate this. But a lot of times, your terminal will legitimately have access to this, especially if you're a developer. Try to get anything to run without giving yourself FDA, right? Um, so in dumping this database, what are they doing? Um, there is a treasure trove of information in this database. For one, it tells you what apps have access to what, right? So if you're looking for what can I exploit, um, what apps are already existing, like 
you can just go ahead and just enumerate which ones are easiest, which ones already have vulnerabilities, and go for those. Um, if your terminal already has FDA, you're golden, right? Um, what and also any code signing requirements. So this is a huge treasure trove of information um, for the adversary. So this command for all my blue teamers or admins, this is the command observed. It's very straightforward. This is a SQLite 3 database. So all they did is just dump access, right? So if you're going to key off strings or key off of uh, dumping this database, um, this is a good uh, thing to add to your arsenal. Some EDRs block this already. So if you're an EDR vendor, uh, get, at, get, get, um, get on top of that, right? So we want to make sure this is blocked. We don't want Lazarus in the environment. Um, if they are blocked, it would be very straightforward for them just to use a select statement instead of dumping the entire thing and then just specify what they're trying to select in terms of access and then grab that result. So here's just an example. Um, that's my hypothesis for if they do get blocked, how they'll pivot. So as any threat researcher does, I pivoted to virus total, right? I was curious, do other adversaries uh, exploit this database? And if so, what they do? So first off, I looked for any DMG or Mako file that had dump access as a string. I got no hits. I was like, OK, all right, I'll play around a little bit more. Let's see anything accessing SQLite 3. Also no hits. So I said, all right, I'll, make a, I'll cast a very broad um, net and just anything that remotely touches the TCC database and I got 29 hits, um, and 40% were malware. So that's that's good, right? As a as someone who used to do detection engineering, that's pretty solid, right? That's at least a moderate confidence level. So I looked into each of those samples. Um, it's like roughly 11 or 12, and wanted to see like you know what adversaries, what types of um, uh, what types of other um, operations do these files perform. So I love when things go for full circle. So the first sample I looked at is a malware sample attributed to Lazarus. So this is Cloud Mensis. Um, they leveraged this over a year ago. And you can see from the, uh, the bottom part that there's a bunch of different um, articles already documenting um, this specific campaign. But I highlighted they actually used inserts. So I'm kind of surprised they went from insert to dumping the entire database. Maybe they got blocked, but this is what they did um, over a year ago. And they uh, were trying to essentially give themselves permission. And you can see like your address book, your documents folder, your calendar, um, developer files, policy desktop, uh, ubiquity. Right. So they're individually inserting themselves and giving themselves access. So I'm like, oh, so this has been around for a little bit for over a year, but recently they've decided to dump the entire thing instead. OK, um, the second malware sample I looked at was Bundlore. So not Lazarus, but it is also a known Mac OS uh, malware adware. Um, this instead copies the database. So you can see it's a CP, and then it makes a db.back, so it makes a copy of this instead. But based off of what I looked into, there are a couple of takeaways. So there's been a couple of malware authors exploiting this database, and um, it's copying, dumping, writing to, inserting, right? So it's the it's the usual suspects. And because I expected to find more things attributed to Lazarus, but only found that one, my hypothesis is that they're decoupling their commands from the malware. Why would they do that? File-based signature. So if you're looking for a match for that specific malware, they're running these commands interactively, right? So it's not associated with a file. So instead, you'd have to make your query based off of like bash or you know whatever um, command interpreter. So that's signature evasion. And with the 29 hits, um, you can easily negate for false positives. So this would be a great detection opportunity uh, to monitor what apps should legitimately be accessing this. And the answer is not many. OK, second. So I was going to submit this as a technique. Never got around to it. But I'm considering maybe after this, I'll submit it as a new technique. So ad hoc signing. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with the concept of signing a file, right? There's a publisher, there's a certificate. Ad hoc signing is this weird gray area where it's signed, but there's not actually a certificate. Um, and there's a long context about it. So it's essentially Intel and Apple Silicon architectures handle a code signing requirements very differently. M1 Max were introduced a couple years ago. They're the first that will block you from running unsigned code. Um, but if you read all the fine print, the TLDR is this does not impact ad hoc signing. So uh, ad hoc signing essentially will allow you to run um, unsigned code. And when I looked into how uh, difficult it is to ad hoc sign, it is very straightforward. 
So if you see this command here, it's literally code sign dash s hyphen, and hyphen means ad hoc signing, right? There's no certificate with it, and then the name of your file. And then if you run code sign again, dash dv, this will tell you, um, as you can see under signature, it's ad hoc, right? So my meme is a little bit overly simplistic, but they never said it had to be a legit developer, right? You sign it, so it gets to run, and therefore it bypasses Gatekeeper. Um, so a couple of notes. Um, I think the tool I've screenshot is Block Block from Patrick Wardle. Um, he is, as per usual, ahead of the game. He noted, like, there's no signing authorities. Like, double check, is it ad hoc? Um, so how should we threat hunt for this? So if I went back to the virus total, and um, it's not great. <laughs> So I learned the hard way that VT does not delineate unsigned versus ad hoc signed. It's all under unsigned. So when I first was like, let's see anything that's not signed, I got 5.1 million hits. So I was like, OK, well, how about if we look for anything crypto adjacent, right, since we like to masquerade as crypto um, applications, 22.2 uh, thousand, so also not great. So I said, OK, give me anything that has any like um, hits on VT, and that limited down to 45. Okay, but it's it's not great, right? So because there's not that fine-tuned delineation, it's just this everything's classified as unsigned. Um, YAR rule in hindsight would have been better looking for the ad hoc signature and looking for a specific uh, operation. So that will be my my next experiment. Um, this is not new to Lazarus. So in looking at um, all the different malware used in previous campaigns, um, in Operation Interception, this is the crypto dream jobs. Uh, they used ad hoc signing with their, their fake Wi-Fi analytics sample and also with the Union Crypto Updater, which was the, the fake uh, crypto application that had their bundled lure. And again, this bypasses Apple Gatekeeper. Um, in recent months, they have released Rust Bucket. So not there's not a lot of malware that's written in Rust, so that's one reason why this is interesting. Um, but they've also already released three variations of this in uh, early spring, May, and June. So the second edition targeted Mac OS, right? So as I was saying with um, them being very cross-platform and being very sophisticated, um, and then the third included new persistence capabilities. So uh, Jamf has a good write-up on this if you're interested. OK, so I'm running a little long time, so I'll speed through this. Um, so synopsis of the TTPs we've covered today, PCC jumping and writing, hopefully next version, maybe Jamie smiling, OK. <laughs> um, ad hoc signing, uh, I have not submitted as a technique, open to feedback, but I'm happy to submit it, because it's not quite the same as invalid code signature, and it's not trying to pretend to be a legitimate developer either. Um, so I think that might be uh, worthwhile creating a separate technique for this. OK, predictions for Lazarus. They are so successful, right? They've made $2 billion. Um, and they're continuing their um, evasion of uh, like EDRs, right, signatures. They're also chunking their malware into multiple stages. So if you have one, but you don't have the remaining pieces, you can't um, actually assess what they're going to do. They're also using the decoupling using command line instead of uh, having the malware perform um, the operation. So they will continue to do this because it works. Uh, Rust Bucket, we already saw three versions of that this year. It will continue to evolve and continue to be used. Social engineering via LinkedIn, a lot of uh, layoffs this year. Just be cognizant <laughs> that if you get someone slides into your DMs on LinkedIn to make sure they're actually legit, uh, make sure their site's actually legit, and then you know don't click on any links. And if they ask for your phone number and they send you a bunch of things, right, uh, make sure to have those sandboxed or uh, don't open those if you're suspicious. Um, if you are a Mac admin, Mac adjacent, I strongly, strongly, strongly uh, emphasize baseline your environment, right, for unsanctioned IT tools, right? If you don't use Jam, if you don't use Jump Cloud, you don't use like any of those tools, if you see that in your environment, that is highly suspicious, right, since you have to actually pay for a license. Um, and then obviously, this is a nation state, they have resources, they have manpower. I just imagine them sitting there listening to Apple's WWDCs and like, be like, oh, interesting. So they're not going to enforce, right? So I have a feeling they're like listening to those talks and seeing what new security features are um, being released. And I do predict that Lazarus will continue um, with their TCC DB exploits. OK, recommendations for blue teamers. Uh, enable your default Apple protections. And if they are disabled, automate re-enabling them. You can use SP. PTL and CSR UTOL to re-enable them. Uh, pay attention if you're in the crypto or fintech or even tech industries. 
Great. And then out auto auditing for shadow IT, baselining your environment, deploy EDR everywhere. And of course, just basic security principle, least privilege always applies. If your security and privacy settings lets every app do everything, right? The attacker is like, this is great, right? You made my job easy. So be judicious in what you grant permissions to. Um, and you can reinforce that using your Mac OS tools, uh, commercial tools. Okay, so I have four minutes. All right, so special thank you to everyone in the Mac OS cyber uh, community, and then of course MITRE for having me. And then you know I would I watched PBS when I was little. Viewers like you, uh, for my first attack on talk. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Obviously, that was uh, fantastic and. No promises about next release, Aww. but next, next. You know, we do we do like to spend a little bit of time fully understanding what you're outlining. But to answer your question about ad hoc signing, yes, please send that. Okay, uh, it's a phenomenal idea. Okay, I do want to open it up uh, to the group. If there's any questions, oh, in the back. <laughs> uh, Just to as repeat far as I know, for the online Mac. audience. Oh, the question sorry. was, is ad hoc signing a Mac only Mac OS exclusive technique, or would something comparable exist in Windows, maybe Linux, uh, maybe even cloud? As far as I know, it's Mac OS only. Um, I will, I'll let you know if I find it differently. I'll like, post it in the, our Slack channel. Uh, sounds like a late night of uh, research ahead of us. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, over here. Yes. Yeah, so there is a, um, there's a command. Just a quick one. I'm sorry, online. I'm No, you're good. No, that's a really good question. Uh, just basically the question was, is there a way to reset the TCC, TCCDD? Um, sorry, that's okay. Yeah. yeah, so there is a command line. Um, I think it was like, like TCCU, something like that. But it's literal only function is to reset the entire database. It's, it's supposed to be a command line version to manage the database, but that's the only command you have, so use that. <laughs> Quick question for me. I know we probably have time for one more after this, uh, maybe, depending on how spicy this is. I know you and Kat are going to have a great time on the couch, by the okay. way. This is um, kind of sad. I'll have to miss that. But um, I love the way you outlined really like looking at an adversary's tradecraft and understanding in the context of what they're trying to speak, but also taking a step back and understanding their motivation. You hinted on this a little bit, but where do you kind of see this like cluster that we call at Lazarus? Like, where do you see them going, especially with that? espionage, financial financial theft kind of, you know, um, intent and motive? Um, I honestly see them continuing what they're doing, right? They need to finance the North Korea somehow. <laughs> um, so I, I would expect with the, uh, the um, how lucrative, like they made $2 billion in crypto that they would keep targeting the big fish. Um, and I think once they add a good time, uh, a good point financially, they'll go back to primarily cyber espionage. So it used to be their primary, and then now it's like almost 100% focused on just the cryptocurrency revenue generation. That's a really interesting note regarding like threat models. Because like you said, it was a little bit, we focused on Mac OS, but there would seem to be a little bit of everything and a little right. bit of everyone. And, and then for all the Windows and Linux admins, like they're, a lot of their TTPs are similar across the operating systems as well. So um, it's good to pay attention to see what they're doing. Always. Uh, we maybe have time for one more if it's quick. Oh, in the front. Um, Just oh, sorry, one for the online audience. What would be the restrictions in terms of usability regarding taking admin rights from a typical Mac OS user? It would be pretty tough as a former Mac OS admin. It was a lot of over my dead body, especially if you have developers. <laughs> um, they will not like that at all. But um, yeah, it's a it's a trade off. <laughs> it might be the second uh, admin cringe moment of the day. Uh, it would reduce it, but for instance, if you're trying to download any application, you would need like admin to install. So you'd have to like put an IT help desk and data. Yeah, so it'd be kind of painful for your IT team, but <laughs> that trade off of security. Maybe another long night of research. Of us. Yeah. <laughs> we can do a purple team tomorrow and see how it plays out. Well, small token of our oh, appreciation. Thank you. thank you so much again, and congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>